Hey everyone, my name is Lisa and I'm the Women's and Marriage Ministry Pastor at Purpose Church. I'm so glad that you have joined our online community today. We are going to continue our study on the book of Nehemiah called Living in Rhythm. Today, we will take a look at God's heart for local missions. But before that, let me tell you a little bit about what's going on at our church. Awana is back. Starting September 7th, you can bring your children to Awana, an international Bible-centered ministry hosted right here on campus every Wednesday from 7 to 8.30 p.m. Kids up to grade 12 will grow closer together, learn how to serve God, and remember His words with the help of our incredible adult volunteers. If you're interested in making an impact by volunteering, email kids at purposechurch.com to sign up or learn more. And to register your children for this ministry, go to PurposeChurch.com slash Awana. Ladies, the Alive Women's event is almost here. We have designed a special weekend just for you. On Friday and Saturday, September 9th and 10th, gather for a powerful weekend of speakers and worship, shopping with local vendors, and more. Go to PurposeChurch.com slash Alive today to get registered. I'll see you there. There are many other ways you can get connected or partner with Purpose Church to further God's kingdom. To find these opportunities or to give online, go to PurposeChurch.com slash give. Well, as we continue to worship, let's pray. Jesus, we invite your presence with us today. Thank you so much that you promise that when we gather that you are here. So we invite your spirit to be here with us. We invite you to do what only you can do. Would you speak? Would you heal? Would you challenge us to live more and more to be your light and your hope and your truth in this world? We love you, Jesus, and we commit ourselves to you now. In the mighty name of Jesus, all God's people prayed and said, amen. Never be more loved than I am right now. Wasn't holding you up, so there was nothing I could do to let you down. It doesn't take a trophy to make you proud. I'll never be more loved than I am right now. Oh. Going through a storm, but I won't go down. I hear your voice carried in the rhythm of the wind to calm me out. You would cross an ocean, so I wouldn't drown. You've never been closer than you are right now, because you are a child.
know who I am. I know what you spoke. I'm more in love, more than I can imagine. And I'm this morning. We love you, Jesus, in your precious name. Great to see a Purpose Church. Before we get into our study, I want to remind you of our 150th anniversary celebration on October 16th. And we are mailing invitations to uh, this week uh, to over 20,000 people, but there is nothing like word of mouth. Word of mouth is the best. And so please invite anyone you know uh, who would enjoy this celebration, maybe their former Purpose Church attenders uh, uh, out of the area or, or even within the area or, or people um, uh, from our community and really encourage you to get the word out. It is going to be just a great, great day on October. October 16th, uh, the three services, 8.30, 10, 11.30, they'll be identical, but we've got a walk through history and a free lunch with in and out and it is just going to be an absolutely wonderful time musically, and, and as, as we look through our history together, and, and then an authorized history of our church that will be available that day, it's just going to be a very, very wonderful and exciting time, finally, in our 152nd year, getting to celebrate our 150th. Uh, you know, he said that if the, if the Tokyo Olympics, um, the 2020 Tokyo Olympics could be in 2021, then we could have our 150th campaign in year 152 because of the pandemic. So it's going to be really great and really, really encourage you uh, to be inviting people. So let's continue our series now entitled Living in Rhythm. 
and it's based on the book of Nehemiah, which uh, Pastor Eric Vasquez uh, dealt with in just a wonderful way, the way he worked through Nehemiah and transforming the city of Jerusalem in the same way we are seeking as a church to transform uh, the city of Pomona. Just did a beautiful job last Sunday of, of kind of systematically going through the story of Nehemiah. Uh, but also we're basing this, and today I will use this as a launching point, uh, one verse, Acts chapter 1, verse 8, where Jesus, his, his, his final marching orders uh, to us uh, before he went to heaven, after his resurrection, he says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, um, Jerusalem, the city they were in, Judea, the near province that they were in, Samaria, the one that was next to Judea, so a little bit further away, and to the ends of the earth. And these are the final marching orders of Jesus uh, before he went back to heaven after his resurrection. So as a church and as individual followers of Christ, we try to fulfill these marching orders, this final command until he returns. We try to fulfill it with all of our strength and with all of our time and with all of our resources. Now, let's work backwards in this verse. God has a heart for the ends of the earth. So as a result, as a church, we uh, send missionaries to the ends of the earth. We support ministries uh, there, uh, feeding people and educating people and encouraging people and providing for their needs while sharing uh, Jesus and, and how they can be saved through Christ to the ends of the earth because God has a heart for the ends of the earth. God has a heart for Samaria, those who are next to us but, but not uh, necessarily right near to us, uh, ne next to us but not here. Uh, so as a result, through the years, we plant and encourage churches in places like Indiana or Montana or Idaho or Rancho Cucamonga or Montclair or Pasadena or, or Claremont. Uh, God has a heart for Judea. Uh, and so each one of us as followers of Jesus, we share Christ uh, where we go to school, uh, where we work. Uh, where we live, in our, in our families. That's our Judea. And now with this series, God has a heart for Jerusalem. He has a heart for the ends of the earth. God has a heart for Samaria. God has a heart for Judea. And God has a heart for Jerusalem. And so we work to bring about transformation to the city in which our church is located, which is the city of Pomona. So the title of today's study is God's Heart for the city. And our emphasis this week, uh, it's a three-part series, and the first was exposure to the brokenness of the city, and then this week is to pray for the city, and the next week is to love and to serve the city. And so the approach I'm going to take is as we get God's heart for the city, uh, Pastor Eric did a great job of showing how Nehemiah got exposed to the needs of the city, and, and, and it broke him. Uh, the situation in Jerusalem was, was desperate. And so it broke his heart because it broke God's heart. And he got himself a heart for the city of Jerusalem. And that led him to pray for the city of Jerusalem, which then led him to serve and to work in the transformation of the city of Jerusalem. And so our prayer emphasis this week is, is what we're doing, and uh, Pastor Eric Vasquez will be here at the end of this message, the very end of it, to give us some practical guidance on that and some resources we can have to pray for our city. But the approach I'm going to take is, let's get God's heart for the city, and then we will naturally pray for the city. When you get God's heart for something, when you get a, a burden for something, when you, when you get a, a, a conviction about something, then you naturally pray for it. You don't have to work it up. Uh, you naturally pray for that thing that you have a heart for. So like I said last Sunday, our local missions pastor, Eric Vasquez, just did a great job of challenging us to be exposed to the brokenness of our city. And he did it based on the book of Nehemiah, which is an Old Testament book. But now today, I want to challenge us to have God's heart for the city. 
and I'm going to base it on New Testament passages, uh, the difference Jesus made when he came into the world, what the world was like before Jesus, then Jesus came in, then he gave us our commands uh, in the New Testament, and then also based on church history. And so I am going to share a bit of church history to kind of know what our heritage is, know what our legacy is, uh, to pray, and then to motivate us to pray uh, for the city. Uh, now, next Sunday, we're going to finish up then with a challenge to love the city and to serve the city. Now, if you're like me, maybe you never thought you'd be part of a church in an urban setting. Maybe you, you, you never thought that that would be the case. I, I remember going to a Christian college, Wheaton College, and there would be speakers that would come and would challenge us to consider serving in an urban setting. I remember thinking, not me, not me. Uh, I grew up rural, so I, I, I love rural. Um, suburbia sounds nice. Uh, ends of the earth, missions, uh, sounds like something I'd be interested in, but if you were to, to kind of rank those, you know, a rural, suburban, um, uh, ends of the earth, overseas, I probably would have put urban ministry as, as the one that I could least see uh, myself uh, doing. And maybe you, like me, never thought you'd be part of a church in a more urban city setting. So uh, a church like in Pomona, where relatively large city, you know, pushing, you know, not getting fairly close to 200,000, you know, 160, 170,000 and, and growing all the time and really more of an urban feel to it. And yet, like me and like Kimberly, God has called you to be a part of this church for such a time as this. God called you and you may not have envisioned that, but, but here you are because of the call of God. Last week we saw God call Nehemiah uh, to the city of Jerusalem in 445 BC. Uh, Esther was called to a city called Susa 34 years earlier than that in 479 BC. And Esther's cousin Mordecai said to her in Esther chapter four, verse 14, he says, and who knows? but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. And any place where God puts you is a royal position because royalty, the king of kings, has assigned you to that place. And so it is a royal position. And you are part of the Purpose Church family in the city of Pomona for such a time as this. And this is a royal position for you. Who knows, but you've been called to Purpose Church in the heart of Pomona, the corner of Holt and Gary, for such a time as this. Now, as I mentioned, Kimberly and I both grew up in a rural setting. So we were totally surprised when God called us here almost 30 years ago. I always tease Kimberly that there were more cows on her farm than there were people in her town. Now that's, that's an exaggeration. Uh, there, were 900, there are 951 people in her hometown. And I don't believe they had quite that many cows. Uh, I grew up with a few cows, but we had a peanut farm in Prince George, Virginia. Uh, Kimberly and I met in Homer, New York, population 3,101. And we were there for 12 years and God did a miracle in that little village, in that little village, God did a miracle. And, and, and that church grew from a couple hundred people uh, to over a thousand people uh, during that 12 year period. But we felt that we were called to the mission field. Uh, we fought, thought we were called to the ends of the earth. And so we began to pray. And the main door that opened up was to pastor an English speaking church in Moscow, in Russia. And, and that was kind of the, the best opportunity for us. But then that door seemed to be open, but then that door closed. Uh, when our son John, who we adopted at the age of eight from an orphanage in Columbia, South America, uh, John had to have multiple surgeries. And the doctor told us that we just couldn't go to Russia, that, that we needed to keep him under American uh, medicine and, and not to go there. And, and so we said, okay, that door has closed. But almost right at that time when that door closed, I mean, I'm talking, it, it was crazy how close it was, almost to the day. 
uh, Kimberly goes to our, our church there, and she was just going to fast and pray uh, for, a, for a day. And we just kind of said, we're going to look to this for another week or two, and then we're going to just kind of put our roots down and stay in Homer for another 12 years, because we loved it, and, and we loved that church, and, and God was doing such great things there. And on that day that Kimberly was uh, praying and fasting, uh, fasting and praying in uh, the church in, in, there in Homer, uh, that very day a letter came in our mailbox asking us to consider coming to First Baptist Church in Pomona, California on the very day that Kimberly had set aside to fast and to pray. And I've told you this story before, but I was so vain that I thought I was the only one who got that letter. <laughs> and come to find out, it had gone out to over a hundred different pastors. And I thought I was the only one. You know, I'm one of those people who actually thinks that I've won the Canadian lottery and all I have to do is send somebody a uh, $1,000 for the transfer fees and that, and that money is mine. <laughs> and so, uh, but, but I think it's because the Holy Spirit was working and because we really sensed this was the call of God. And so we learned, as you have learned, I'm sure, that God works through unanswered prayer as much as through answered prayer and leads you into places you thought you'd never go. Now, let me repeat that. God works through unanswered prayer as much as through answered prayer and leads you into places that you never thought uh, that you would go. Now, God, of course, loves people in rural areas. And God loves people in suburban areas. But God has given us here at Purpose Church a love for the people of the city of Pomona. And he has called you here for a purpose. Genesis 12, verse 1, the Lord said to Abram, go from your country, your people, and your father's household. And like I said last Sunday, uh, maybe you uh, live in Pomona and you go to church in Pomona, but maybe you come from another city, an another place in our Inland Valley or in, in Southern California, and you drive past some wonderful churches, some wonderful churches, and yet somehow God called you to go from your country, from your city, uh, your people and your father's household to the land that I will show you. And God has called you to be a part of a church in the city and to serve here and to give here and to have an impact here for the transformation of a city with great need and great brokenness. And, and, and they, they, the city needs our church here. The city needs you here. And that's why God called you here. Now, Christianity started rural in Galilee. So it started rural, but it soon became an urban phenomenon. Uh, its headquarters were in Jerusalem, but then later on in the larger cities of the Roman Empire. Now, maybe not all that large by our standards, but these were big cities uh, for the ancient world. Uh, it became uh, launching pads for the gospel, it came out of places like Corinth, who had a population of 50,000 or Athens, who had a population of 75,000 people, or Rome, who had a population of 450,000 people. And these cities were crowded. Do you know that Manhattan in New York City uh, today has 100 people per acre? Calcutta, India has 122 people per acre. But Rome had 302 people per acre. And it was very crowded, and it had some severe urban problems. Uh, Rome had a huge sanitation problem. They, the historians tell us, the people for that time tell us that you could smell the Tiber River that went by Rome. You could smell it from miles away. Uh, Rome and other cities had open sewage ditches running down their streets with human corpses discarded into them. Uh, just awful conditions. An analysis of uh, decayed human, human fecal remains by archaeologists in an ancient Jerusalem cesspool found an abundance of tapeworm eggs. Uh, the cities of that time were filled with disease and filled with crime. 
And into these cities, Jesus called his followers to bring healing and help and transformation and mercy and love. And he calls us here at Purpose Church to the city of Pomona and to Los Angeles County. Uh, here is a list of the eight biggest cities in the world. Number one on the list is Tokyo at 34 million. Number two on the list is Seoul, Korea at 25 million. Uh, number three on the list is Mexico City at 22.6 million. Number four is New York City at 22 million. Uh, number five is Sao Paulo, Brazil at 20.2 million. Uh, million. Number six is Mumbai in India at 19.7 million. Uh, number seven on the list is Delhi, also in India, at 19.5 million. And number eight on the list is Los Angeles with 18 million. Now, urban ministry can be discouraging at times. You can often feel like the, the wind is in your face rather than at your back. It, it can be difficult. Cesar Chavez writes, it is possible to become discouraged about the injustice we see everywhere. But God did not promise us that the world would be humane and just. He gives us the gift of life and allows us to choose the way we will use our limited time on earth. It is an awesome opportunity. And so Jesus gave us our, our commands uh, to reach out to people. He said in Matthew chapter 25, for I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. That's why our church uh, feeds over a 1,000 people locally uh, on a regular basis each year. Uh, we clothe over 3,000 people uh, each year, uh, we give away over 10,000 items of clothing each year in, 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 in response to the commands and the guidance of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He told us to do it, so we do it. That's why we do prison ministry that Pastor Eric uh, talked about last Sunday. To hear our king say these words in verse 40, the king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these, Brothers and sisters of mine, you did it for me. And then the followers of Jesus taught the same thing. Uh, James, the brother of Jesus, says in James 2, verse 15, suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well-fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. Rodney Stark, who's the foremost uh, expert on the time of the Roman Empire and, and the rise of Christianity within the Roman Empire, uh, said in contrast to what Jesus taught and what his followers and, and the leaders of this movement taught, in contrast to that in the pagan world, now by the way, pagan is not meant to be like a negative word, you know, you pagan. No, it was a technical term for anybody who was not a Christian in the Roman Empire. Uh, the technical term was uh, pagan. In contrast, in the pagan world, and especially among the philosophers, we're talking supposedly the smartest people that ever lived, people like Plato and Aristotle, uh, the, these really brilliant people that influenced the great Greek culture and the Roman Empire, especially among the philosophers, mercy that Jesus taught us was regarded as a character defect and pity as a pathological emotion because mercy involves providing unearned health or relief. It is contrary to justice. You know, we take these things for granted that mercy is a good thing. And yet in the world before Jesus, it was practically unknown. Charity was unknown. Mercy, helping people in need was unknown until Jesus came into the world like a bright light on a darkened night, uh, he broke through and everything changed. E.A. Judge writes, classical philosophers, that is again like Plato and Aristotle, taught that mercy indeed is not governed by reason at all. And humans must learn to curb the impulse to be merciful. 
The cry of the undeserving for mercy must go unanswered. Pity was a defect of character, unworthy of the wise, and excusable only in those who have not yet grown up. In comparison to this, mercy is a part of the DNA for a follower of Jesus. This is the world Jesus came into. And he came in and he said, things are gonna be different now. Get used to different. We're going in a different direction. I'm gonna turn this world upside down. And this continued throughout uh, church history uh, right up to the present. Esther Chung Kim is a member of our uh, church family here at Purpose Church. And she is the Associate Professor of Religious Studies at Claremont McKenna College, right here uh, in Claremont. And she recently wrote a book. And if you're into history and if you love church history, this is the kind of book you can really geek out on. But it's a, but it's a very, very academic book. It's called Economics of Faith, Reforming Poor Relief in Early Modern uh, Europe. And, and, and she wrote this book, which demonstrates, she shows how a big part of the Protestant Reformation we think of it as more of a spiritual revival, the Protestant Reformation around 500 years ago in 1500 AD. We think of it as kind of a spiritual revival, but, but she writes in this book, and it's just fascinating how in addition to that, this revival in the church, actually a big part of it led the church to have greater concern for the poor. And a big part of that spiritual revival was a call to get back to our roots in the early church and the teachings of Jesus and the teachings of the early leaders like Paul and James and, and others like that, a greater concern for the poor. Uh, here's what she writes in her introduction of this book. Nobody ought to go begging among Christians, wrote Martin Luther in the first of his three tracts in 1520. There should be no beggars among Christians, asserted Andreas Karlstadt in his January 1522 tract. In these quotes, two of the earliest, Wittenberg, which was the center of the Protestant Reformation, Wittenberg, Germany, Wittenberg reformers set a new standard for poor relief. A Christian society could not neglect taking care of the poor, but it was a tall order in an era of plagues and harsh winters, crop failures, and economic downturns. Religious leaders in their multiple roles as preachers, policymakers, advocates, and community leaders sought to help create another layer of support for the vulnerable because poverty was a problem too big for any one group to tackle. This study examines the role of religious leaders in the development of poor relief reforms during the, product, during the Reformation in order to provide a greater understanding of how religious ideals and rationales fueled the reformations of both church and society. Uh, John, one of the disciples of Jesus writes, dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. I'm gonna quote several of the early leaders of the early church. And you know, just a little bit of an aside, that sometimes uh, people call Christianity a white man's religion and nothing could be further from the truth. Christianity was birthed right where Asia and Africa and Europe, right, right where they all come together. Uh, Christ represented uh, all of those uh, ethnicities of, of that area, which really was symbolic of representing all the ones of the world. And you know, something fascinating I found that I didn't even realize till after this study was over. But do you know that each one of the early church leaders that I'm gonna quote in the, in the next couple of minutes, every one of them, were pastors in Africa, church leaders in Africa. That was North Africa, uh, Egyptian, places like Carthage and Alexandria and other places like that. But every one of them, every one of these uh, are African. Every one of these are from the continent of Africa. And all these early influencers uh, within uh, the, the early church. Here's one, Cyprian, uh, who uh, was killed for his faith in Jesus. And uh, he was martyred. And he was the Bishop of Carthage, which was again on the continent of Africa. There's nothing remarkable in cherishing merely our own people with the due attentions of love. Thus the good was done to all men, not merely to the household of faith. Not just serving the needs of those that are close to us or part of our families, but everybody 
made in the image of God. Everybody's a child of God, and so everybody needs to be loved and cared for. Uh, Paul Johnson writes, the Christians ran a miniature welfare state in an empire which for the most part lacked social services. Tertullian, uh, again, uh, one of the church leaders on, on the continent of Africa, an African church leader in 155 to 120 or 222 uh, AD. He said, these gifts, and I love this quote so much. Let me break it down for you here. These gifts, that is the giving of Christ followers to help those in need. These gifts are, as it were, piety's deposit fund. Okay, it's almost like a, a spiritual IRA, a 401k. For they are not taken thence. Okay, what he's saying is these early Christians could have taken their money and spent it on feast, drinking bouts, and eating houses. He says the, these people that are followers of Jesus, they take a portion of their money and, and they don't spend it on parting, feast. They don't spend it on bar crawls or pub crawls, drinking bouts, or eating houses, even restaurants. But instead, they take a portion of it that could have gone to those things, and they use it to support and bury poor people, to supply the wants of boys and girls, of destitute means and parents, and of old persons confined now to the house, such too as have suffered shipwreck. And if there happen to be any in the mines or banished to the islands or shut up in prisons for nothing but their fidelity to the cause of God's church, they become the nurslings of their confession. Uh, the apostolic confession, this is a part of the writings that guided the early church, said deacons, that is church leaders, are to be doers of good works, exercising a general supervision day or night, neither scorning the poor nor respecting the person of the rich. They must ascertain who are in distress and not exclude them from a share in church funds, compelling also the well-to-do to put money aside for good works. We have a thing called the Deacons Fund here at our church. And thousands upon thousands of dollars that you have given quietly behind the scenes are going to, to people in need all the time. Exactly what we've been doing as followers of Christ for 2,000 years. And what was noticed across the Roman Empire, and it was one of the reasons so many people turned to Christ and how the Roman Empire uh, turned to uh, Christian, which is one of the great miracles in all of, of human history, what they noticed across the Roman Empire was how Christians acted during pandemics. Oh, that's challenging, isn't it? One of the, one of the engines for church growth in the early church was non-Christians watching how Christians acted during pandemics. In 165 AD, smallpox appeared uh, for the first time. And in just 15 years, it killed uh, between a fourth and a third of the population of the Roman Empire. Happened again 100 years later. And Bishop Dionysius, around 251 AD, another leader in the African church, he said, uh, at the first onset of the disease, they, the pagans, pushed the sufferers away and fled from their dearest throwing them into the roads before they were dead and treated unburied corpses as dirt, hoping thereby to avert the spread and contagion of the fatal disease. So the pagan priests fled the city when the pandemic hit, they fled the city to go to safer places. When things got difficult in the city, they fled the city to a safer place. And we as a church, it's part of our history, had an opportunity about 40 years ago or so uh, uh, to leave the city of Pomona and to go um, to someplace different. We had that opportunity. And God told us, stay where you are. Just like these early Christians, God told us as a church, don't leave, stay right where you are. And the Christians back in the early church, stayed. And they saved a huge number of people, but put themselves in danger in the process. They heeded the words of Paul, where he says in Philippians 1, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. 
uh, back to Bishop Dionysius of Alexandria. He said, most of our brothers showed unbounded love and loyalty, never sparing themselves and thinking only of one another, heedless of danger. They took charge of the sick, attending to their every need and ministering to them in Christ. And with this departed this life serenely happy. For they were infected by others with the disease, drawing on themselves the sickness of their neighbors and cheerfully accepting their pains. Many in nursing and curing others transferred their death to themselves and died in their stead. The best of our brothers lost their lives in this manner. A number of presbyters, that is pastors, deacons, that is church leaders, and laymen winning high commendation so that in the death of this form, the result of great piety and strong faith seems in every way to be the equal of, of martyrdom. This is our spiritual DNA. This is who we are as followers of Jesus. This is our history. The, this is our, leg, our, our heritage. The, this is the heritage we have received from other followers of Christ over the centuries, over the last 2,000 years. Uh, John 15, Jesus said, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. And one way to lay down your life is to be part of a church that is exposing itself to the brokenness of its city, who is gaining God's heart for the city, which this week will take a practical form of spending this week praying for the city, uh, that is learning uh, through this time, challenged uh, by our local missions pastor, Pastor Eric Vazquez, and, and challenged through our study of, of history and of Nehemiah, and putting into action Acts 1, verse 8, that we are learning during this time how to love the city of Pomona, the city in which our church is located, and how to serve this city as well. Let's close with this. Just one block east of uh, downtown Los Angeles is uh, one of the most dangerous, overlooked, marginalized places in the United States of America, and that's Skid Row. Uh, Skid Row is a place where horrible things happen all the time. Women and children are the most vulnerable to the crimes, but you also have gang members and drug dealers who sell drugs near rescue missions and uh, hinder efforts to help people in the area. This is where I work. This is where God called me to be. And I believe that with my whole heart. You know, the reality here is most people don't really like police officers. They're taught to hate us because they feel we're after them because of their social status or race or whatever. It's really hard to meet somebody you really want to help and have them reject you. Some of them hate my guts. And I really, truly, honestly care about them. Well, I try to look at people the way I think God looks at people. And in spite of all our mistakes, God still loves us. So in spite of all the mistakes that a lot of the people in Skid Row have made, I want to show them that I love them and I want to help make their lives better. You gotta get out of your car sometimes, remove your judgmental idea about who people are and what a good person should be, and, you know, and get out there and get to know these people. Cause you'll find that even though some of them have a lot of problems, severe problems, mild problems, they're people. Let me fill it. Mm -hmm. There you go, that's it. That's the real deal right there. Look at here. All right. Uh, Dion Joseph, call me Dion. They're told the police hate you. But I destroy that theory when I get out in that street because those folks will test you. If you say you care, they're going to hold you up to it. 
okay, Joseph, you care? Put me in some housing. That Dion? Okay. Yes, oh, Dion. Real? Yeah, if you're interested in some 90 day housing? Yes, yes. Okay. What I want you to do is Thursday, go see my friend, she's, okay. a, she's a wonderful lady. Over time, the people see you for who you are, not what you are. They know I'm doing what I'm doing, not to harass them, but because I'm for them. All right? We'll do both. All right, ladies, take care. Hey, how are you? You know, you're a star. How you doing? Because you love this kid around here. I do, I do. Get to know people on an individual basis. I know their names. I know when they've been sober. I know when they're high. People always ask me, how can you work here? How could you sit here all this time? My faith in God is what keeps me from packing up and leaving town. This is my assignment. It's like a driving force that keeps me having faith in this community. You know, that says, don't let him go yet, Dion. Don't let him go. Hey everyone, Eric here, your local missions pastor at Purpose Church. And I wanna uh, encourage you guys uh, to continue walking with us in this Nehemiah series. You can visit our website, purposechurch.com living, and there you're gonna find guides that are gonna be super helpful tools for you to uh, sign up for immersion experiences. It's not too late to do that. Um, but today's focus was all about our prayer experience and the importance of prayer. So our guide to our prayer experience is gonna live on the website. It's a PDF version and it's gonna have step-by-step -step instructions for you so you can have a successful experience this week. And remember to follow our social media and subscribe to our YouTube channel and make sure to click the bell icon to receive notifications throughout the week. I hope to see you in person or here online again soon. God bless you all.